Welcome back to the Mojo Podcast with me, Richard Stokes. I hope you've had a great week. And I hope you enjoyed last week's episode with Ken Okorafor. And a big theme of that one was transition from one path in life to another, from, in his case, from his city career to being a YouTube creator around personal finance. I feel there's a lot of transformation going on right now, some of it perhaps enforced by redundancy and business closure, and some because it's just the right time to make a move in a new direction. Either way, I hope hearing some of these Mojo stories gives you some inspiration, knowledge, even comfort. Sometimes just hearing from some other people who have already made a move can help us break through whatever barriers are in our way. This week's episode is another change story about finding your true calling, or in my guest's case this week, you might say finding your true colours. Yes, I can almost hear Cindy Lauper in my ears. Karin Huller is a colour psychologist, and yes, we'll explain exactly what that is in the episode. This Mojo conversation is really an insight into her long journey to not just find her path, but almost build it, as it was not a well-trodden path, as you'll hear. Imagine knowing intrinsically that you're looking for something, but not quite being able to find it. It could be really, really frustrating, so much so it might stop you. But for Karin, it drove her on, seeking out what her thing was. And then when she found it, no one fully understood it, which made making a business out of it rather tricky. She shares the tough moments, such as facing a crippling fear of public speaking, and then some of the payoff, being commissioned to write a best-selling book which has readers around the world and is helping more people find their authentic selves through colour. Now, one transformation many of us have made recently is working from home. And Karen shares some great tips towards the end of our chat about how to bring colour into your home office to help with energy, with focus, collaboration, and perhaps what we all need more of right now, fun. I hope you like the episode. Please do share it, subscribe for future episodes, and leave a five-star rating. And help me turn a lovely shade of blushing red with a really kind review. Thank you, and enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Mojo Podcast. Today, my guest is Karen Huller, a colour psychologist and author of The Little Book of Colour. Uh, Karen, it's lovely to have you on the show. Um, and for once, just to let everybody know, you can hear our voices, but we can actually see each other, Karen and I, because we decided we wanted to uh, use Zoom so we could see each other and interact a little bit more. So, uh, Karen, how are you? I'm, I'm quite well, thank you. How are you? I'm very well. Yeah, I'm very well. I've been looking forward to this for some time, actually. Uh, certainly since we spoke briefly on the phone a couple of weeks ago. Um, and Karen, you know, I, I always ask this question right up the front. How is your mojo doing today? Yeah, because this is one of the questions you said you were, you were going to ask first up. And this morning, I just thought, gosh, how is, how is my mojo? And what was really interesting is that I'm actually quite... I'm actually quite tired. I've been really tired the last few days. And I actually thought, I thought, oh gosh, my mojo is really low. But then I realized actually tiredness and how I feel has got nothing to do with my mojo. It's actually two separate things. So I actually learnt something myself, even by pondering this question. So my energy levels are really, really low, but my mojo doesn't change. That's always like an eight and nine. That's always really high for me. It's just right. that I just don't feel I just feel quite tired do you, do you know what I mean yeah yes yeah so that I mean that's really interesting that the when you, you talk about energy and mojo being actually for you quite separate um, and for some people they're very interlinked but you, you actually you sort of drawn them apart which is interesting so your mojo generally always high you, yeah you always high eight or nine. so what then if mojo is not energy for you what what is it what does it mean to it's you? it's what lights me up it's what it's what gets me up in the mo in the morning um it's my vision my passion it's the change i want to you know without sounding too woo woo it is the it is the change i want to make in the world it's the thing that is bigger than me that's almost unattainable and so therefore can you see how it's got nothing to do with my energy because mm. i can still i can be really high energy or really low but that that passion, that drive is, is unwavering and it is still there. And mm. it is when I, you know, and I'm sure we'll get into this later on in my kind of 
well, I, inverted commas, darkest moments. And when I think, gosh, you know, what am I doing? And can I even make a job out of this or a career out of this? It was, it was that mojo. Now I know it was that mojo that, that did get me out of bed, even though I was just, you know, felt like there was nothing in the tank. Mm. So it's this, this, this purpose, this mission you're on, you this, this mm. higher calling almost, this vision. Yeah, yeah. But just, on the, just on the energy, I'm really curious. Do you, do you feel you are making more impact if the energy is also high or does it matter so much? Um, it feels like I do more because I can work faster. I can work really fast. I, I can do a lot of things. Um, I don't want to say it once, but I can juggle a lot of balls and I'm, I, I love variety. I love spontaneity. I love having a lot of things going. So I can get more done. It's just that when my energy is low, I still get things done, but it's much, it's much slower. Mm. So the last okay. three days, my energy has just been so low and really flat and my to-do list has grown. But do you know mm. what? That's okay because that's not going anywhere. <laughs> no, that, that will be mm. still waiting for me. I just, I just do less. Um, but then one of the things I do is I really, you know, I, I, I'm quite good at prioritising and then I just prioritise even better and think what is the absolute thing that I must do next and what's the most important thing and not looking at, oh, I've got this massive list to do. So, um, mm. so I, just, yeah, I just work a lot slower. Got it, got it. Yeah. So there's, there's an impact, but it, it's not having a, a wider impact on your as you say, your, your wider mission and the thing that you want to get no. done, you just... No, maybe, no, because that's indeed, unwavering. Right, yeah. and maybe indeed yeah. it makes your, prior, your prioritisation, your decision-making even clearer. If you yes, know, yes, you yeah. To, yeah. To, uh, to deliver. Right, got it. Mm. Um, so I introduced you as a colour psychologist, and I've mentioned uh, that I'm talking to you, I've got you as a guest on the show, to several people, and their eyes kind of light up with interest. Go, oh, wow. And they say... What's a colour psychologist? So my, my area of expertise, my area of focus and study is very much on how colour influences how we think, how we feel and how we behave. So it's very much around colour and design, so colour and design psychology, which is behavioural design. Um, this, is, this is where my passion and this is where my, um, well, one of my, I should say one of my passions, but this is where something I'm really interested in, how colour can, can influence us and change how we, how we think, feel and behave in, in, a, in a second. Mm. Um, we, can, we can change the colours that we're wearing. We can, we can change the colours that are in our home, in our office. Um, you know, we probably find ourselves working, walking past two or three co coffee shops or even uh, restaurants before we will walk into one and go, how, why did we pick this one? because this is the one that we connect to and this is the one that feels like us and the one where we feel we belong. And this is, this is my area of fascination of how, how colour and design um, has this impact on us. Mm. So this, 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 this sense of belonging seems really in, in, intrinsic to this and we just yes. feel closer somehow, more connected, yep. as you say, due, due to a colour connection that, and are we making that, and this is a completely subconscious thing? On the whole. So we're usually only about 20% conscious of the colour choices that we make or the decisions we make based on colour and design psychology. Mm. One of my big goals is to make it that we are using colour consciously. So this is, this is one of my really big visions um, is, is to do this, which is what, that's why like you'll probably hear throughout this podcast that my goals or my aims are really big and really audacious and, might almost be unattainable but that's what i love about them because they're always they're always ahead of me and there's always it's always something to strive for mm. so one of my big things is if we can use color more consciously and design more consciously um, in all areas of our life and we use them in a way that um, brings out our own authentic personality that um that we that we feel a sense of connection, we feel a sense of belonging and a sense of authenticity and we show up authentically. Imagine the change that that will make in the world. Imagine the change that when we can make our own choices and our own decisions based on what feels right for us and not, not it coming from an outside source. I mean, that to me, 
that's something that I think is fundamental across anybody that has a big audacious goal or a vision or a mission is 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 to be authentic and for um, for our own choices people to better make our own choices mm. so that's kind of my big thing and my vehicle for that is color right, so the, 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 so the what the wider the wider mission is about this um, being our true selves fulfilling our potential and yeah. then really delivering this through as you say the, the, the medium of color you might say what drew you into this this line this area of interest this field of work because you know this is not something that is put in front of many people when they're i don't know school leavers or at university as any kind of option and you and you've and you said it's not a traditional line of psychology it's something you've it sounds to me like you've kind of built yourself is that is that fair oh um no i wouldn't say that gosh um it, it might sound like that because i'm quite well known for this but um thousands of years this has been this is there has been people talking about this and investigating this and and coming up with theories for thousands of years um so um you know the ancient egyptians how they use color how aristotle used color um and his theories and ideas goethe i know i've just missed like thousands of years then but there's <laughs> goethe there's carl jung there are so many um, philosophers, scientists, um, artists, poets, you know, there's the Bauhaus with Itten and Kandinsky. Everybody built on from who came before. Mm. And that's, that's the whole idea of this, is that you take what has come before and you add to it, and then somebody will come after you and, and, add, and add to it. And that's how it, that's how it builds momentum and that's how it grows. And so my teacher was uh, Angela Wright, and she's a UK, um, she's based in the UK, and she took all of the work beforehand and a lady called Susan Kale, who is in the US, you know, basically taking all of their work and summarising it into a theory. And then I've taken her work and everyone else's work and built on that. So this is what, this is what we do. Right. And it's all about um, experiential it's experiential data it's experiential design it is it is not looking at human beings as ones and zeros and everybody will when everyone sees that color this is the one way they will behave absolutely not this is why it's such a big big area of study because it's looking at all the facets and as human beings we're not binary you know we're not ones and zeros so I'm very much about the experiential design and, and how as human beings, we have this experience with ourselves, with our environment, with each other and with nature, because mm. all of these things combine together. Mm. But answering your question, um, which was, how did I even get into this? So basically it was one complete stumble. I didn't even know I was even looking for this. So, um, as, as a child, I think most children, we all love colour, you know, and I was very much the crayon girl and the hands in the paints and playing with colours and wondering which colour, you know, to play with next and getting it all over the place other than on the paper. Um, but then as growing up in my teens, I was definitely the, 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 the teenager who um, would try every single art and craft and I would do it for three months, six months, and just go, oh, okay, this isn't it. And I never knew what this isn't it meant. Mm. And then I'd go, oh, bright, shiny thing. Oh, I'll try decoupage. Oh, yeah, I could do that now. Yep. Oh, I'll try, I'll try macrame. I'll try artwork. I'll try knitting. I'll try, you know, whatever it was, I would try and do, I'll go and do. And then and I used to think, gosh, why have I got such a short attention span and why do I not last anything very long? Then I, when I finished school, I just happened to fall into IT. So fall into project managing and business analyst. Mm. And um, because- that, that, that seems a long way away from this it, fascination it, with color. It and is. Yeah, it's a long craft. way away. Yeah, and um, well, because when I got offered the job, it paid three times as much as any other job that was out there. So I basically did that and I knew that I really wanted to travel abroad. So, mm. I, um, so I took it. And then it allowed me to travel abroad and I could travel and visit different countries and so forth. And, um, and I, during the day, so I always say I live a split life. So during the day I was 
IT project managing business analyst. And at night I was studying. So I studied fashion design and I thought, oh, this is it because I'd made my clothes all through my teens. And then I realized when I finished just what a cutthroat industry it was. And I thought, I'm not going to survive. You know, this is too mm. ruthless for me. In terms and then of I the went fashion on, industry. Yeah, it's yeah. really, yeah, you have to be pretty, um, like I can come across as quite a, I can come across with a kind of a hard exterior, but really inside it would just, it would have just killed me. And so then I went on to um, do uh, millinery and, and I thought, oh, you know, well, this is it. And anyhow, so doing millinery and then I was blocking this blue felt hat that I had just, um, I just made and I, and I was putting on feathers and ribbons and then right in front of the class, out of nowhere, I just went, oh my God, it's colour. And I thought, well, what, what on earth does that mean? Anyhow, so me being me, off I went and I went and studied colour for a year at the, what was at the time Sydney School of Colour and Design. But I realised that I was asking, um, you know, a lot of, um, I was asking a lot of questions that my teachers weren't able to answer. The questions I was asking were things like, why is it that I like this colour and my, you know, my friend next to me doesn't? And why is it that I liked it today, yesterday, but not today? Why, why am I feeling this way? You know, all these kind of questions. I didn't realise they were all kind of behavioural questions. Mm. And, um, and I just found that my questions weren't being answered. And so I went on this whole mission of trying to find as much as I could about colour and not knowing still what I was looking for. And then when I was in the UK and I was doing like my upteenth weekend workshop, trying to find this thing, this is when I stumbled across my colour teacher, Angela Wright. And I had really, I guess my first, you know, my really big, I guess my first epiphany moment was blocking, you know, when I said, oh my God, it's colour. Yeah. And my second one was, oh, what I'm looking for actually has a name and it's, it's colour psychology. Right. And that's when I went, oh my God, this is it. This is it. This is what I've been searching for for years and the upteenth courses that I've done. Because I did colour therapy and I went, that isn't it. And I did colour you know, therapy for interiors and all that. And I'm like, no, 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 this isn't it. This isn't it. And then I went, this is it. It's colour psychology because there's a logic and there's a rationale behind it. And there is, um, and there's a theory that's really robust that, look, I, I'm someone who, if I get something, I try and break it. And so I did that training about 15 years ago now. And since then, I've been trying to break the theory because when you do anything to do with science, even though psychology is considered a soft science, you don't set out to prove, you set out to disprove. So I very much, I always come up with theories and then I try and break them. Mm. Right. So I spend the rest of my, you know, I'll be spending the rest of my days trying to, you know, break break the theories because that's what makes it more robust and stronger. And when you right. do find a little chink or something, or you find a little um, something that you need to add on because there is another circumstance that you need to, or another context you need to think about, it, it just, it just makes what you do stronger and more robust. Right. And, and does that go back to when you were talking about all the, the thousands of years of thinkers and scholars that have come before you and you're building on that? through yes. this testing and probing and yes, yes, stress yes. testing the theory. That's what you're yeah, doing. Yeah, yeah. And, right. and so now you can see me being a business analyst and a project manager in my previous career is, is perfectly, is, yes. per, is a perfect match. Yes. Because everything I do around colour is this, is this analysis. So when we said before it's like a million years away, that's what I thought as well. And there was a long time that I actually didn't want anyone to know that I had this other life because oh. it was almost like, not that I was ashamed, but I just, um, I just didn't want, I, I, I can't even say the reason why, I just didn't want people to know. And now I just think, my gosh, what a valuable gift that I've been able to bring these two things together. Mm. But I, I, am, I am jumping ahead. Um, around about 2006 is when I decided to actually make the big leap and to move into colour full time. Right. So th um, this, is, this is quitting the lucrative IT yeah, world. Yeah, the very going, lucrative. You know I'm going to do this. And the very it. lucrative IT world mm. uh, into stepping into, uh, which I didn't know, into a recession. I guess no one knows. <laughs> we don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> And then I, um, and I'm sure people are going to listen, who's listening, just think, you know, this is kind of like a bit of a duh moment. But um, 
I uh, also didn't realise that people didn't know what colour psychology was. And when I used to say what I do, people would go, what the F is that? I mean, I would get that all the time. Right. And, I was, and I was like, oh, you are kidding me. <laughs> You're kidding me. I have just set up this whole, you know, when you start up, you think you're setting up a business, but, you know, this startup, because it's not a business, it's just a, it's, you're setting up an idea. Um, and then I'm thinking, oh, my God, no one knows what it is. What the hell do I do? Uh, so then I spent probably the first four or five years uh, educating, which is writing blogs, articles, and, you know, thank God for the media. The media love a new story. And because colour psychology and what I was talking about was new, I was in the media, and I still am in the media quite a lot, um, but I was in the media a lot. And they also helped get the words out. Oh, sorry, get the message out. Yes, that was a really tricky, tricky stage. But but I just knew there's nothing else I wanted to do. So right, because you'd been on this clearly on this mission to find what it was. You've had these two epiphanies. You've got this uh, an amazing feeling that that must have given you. That I guess created the belief and the bravery to quit quit the IT job, move into something new, and then you find out no one really understands what I do. I mean, how how did you feel? I think when I when I really realised what I wanted to do, I I'm not I wasn't at that at that point. I wasn't the person that wanted to be a spokesperson or be out in the front. Uh, you know, my biggest thing was that I just wanted to be really in a white coat in a lab, tucked away somewhere, just you know, you could call it self indulging. Um, you know, doing experiments and 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 doing theory work. And you know, mm. I would be quite happy just to potter around and work with colour all day. Then because I find out that no one knows diddly squat about this, <laughs> I just thought, well, uh, I've, I've, I've got to get out and talk about it. Now, my biggest fear, my biggest, biggest fear in the world was public speaking. Absolutely mm. my hugest fear. In my private life, I go scaling mountains, I go trekking, I go hiking, I jump off cliffs. Yeah. I'm, I'm you know... You mentioned sharks, I think. Yeah, swimming with sharks, you know, all, you know, got circled by sharks and, you know, all that kind of stuff, you know. And to me, that's just adventurous and that's all fun and it's exciting. The thought of um, public speaking was, was for me, you know, worse than death. It was... Mm. And so I had a um, marketing, uh, someone was helping marketing, and she said to me, she said, Karen, you know, no one knows about what you're talking about. And it's, it, what, what you're doing is so amazing. I think you should get up and speak. And when she said that, I remember we were in a hotel um, cafe and tears just shot out of my eyes horizontally and I sobbed. I sobbed and, and my whole body was shaking. I can, God, I can still remember that now. Wow. And... Um, and every time I said to her, I can't, I can't, I can't. And I used to go networking. And you know when you have to get up and do your one minute? Mm. That one minute would haunt me the whole entire week. And then when I would get up and say what I had to say, I had a face, you would think I had a face like thunder. I was so frightened. And when I sat down, I was shaking that I went and did a five day, it's you know, one of these people, I throw myself into something and I think I've got to do it, I've got to do it. So I threw myself into a five day public speaking course and I was known as the runner. <laughs> so all eyes were on me because they said, at some point, Karen is going to run. Now, of course, <laughs> when I planned my escape, I ran. But this determination I have in my private life about scaling mountains and scaling Kilimanjaro and, you know, and, and, and kind of, you know, not, not giving up, I had, to, I had to really pull all of that energy and bring that into my work because I, I wasn't doing that. But it's one of those things when you know you have something to say and it's so powerful and you feel you're being energetically pushed forward. Like I felt like something was always at the back of my head and pushing me forward. So it probably took me five, six, maybe even 10 years to get over my fear of public speaking. But I chipped away and I chipped away and I chipped away. Call me stubborn, call me determined, you know, like whatever it is. I, I had that to deal with as well as trying to educate and get it out what I was doing that no one knew what it was. So I became the accidental spokesperson for the work that I do. 
it was never my intention. Um, and I found myself in it. And I was actually, at one stage, I actually said to my teacher, Angela, I said, why does nobody know about this? Like what? And I actually was quite cross at her. I was like, I thought I could just walk in and there'd be a ready-made market. Like, why, ha why does nobody know about this? And then I thought, well, actually, if I'm at the front, then I'm at the front and I can lead. And so I thought, right, use this. Whatever, whatever barrier I came across, I thought, right, how can I use this to my advantage? And because I used to play a lot of competitive sport, I used to, be, I used to play basketball through my teens. And, um, and so I thought, right, I'm just going to take my, that competitiveness that I've got and I'm just going to put that into my work as well and really drive, drive right. this forward. So I basically took everything that I knew and everything that I do in my own private life and I um, had to really consciously bring it into my business to bring it forward. Otherwise, mm. I would have probably just stayed caught up in a ball just thinking this isn't fair and why isn't it working? So yeah. you're overcoming personal fears of as you say, getting up on stage and being that vulnerable. You're mm. overcoming lack of awareness of what you actually do. Yeah. Um, but you, it sounds like you're having the awareness to rely on. But in my personal life, I have done all these things. So if I've done all yeah. these things, surely I can apply that to this new world. Yes. Yes. And really, what's really I found really interesting is for my business to grow, I had to grow personally. And mm. then once I grew personally, then my business business grew a bit more. And but then I realised I was pushed more. And then all my you know, insecurities or my, oh, that's not fair or why is that person doing better than me? Or, you know, all these kind of self-doubts that I have as I work through the, and I make sure that I work through them all because that that to me is then my my drive and my determination because right. because of my mojo, because I really want to, um, you know, I really do want to make this change and there's and there's nothing else I want to do. Like if somebody said to me, well, come off and do this, there's nothing, there's nothing else I want to do. So that's what kept me going. And that's, and if I wasn't, if I wasn't so clear on, on what I wanted to achieve on what I wanted to do, then I, I probably would have given up. Let, let's kind of move on into that area a bit. We talk about the book and talk about the business because you've made, you're on this mission. You've made this huge change. You're putting yourself into quite uncomfortable scenarios, obviously, with, with, the, with the speaking sometimes. How was it getting all this thought, these ideas you have down on paper and writing a book? Where did that come from? So the book came from Penguin calling me, well, sending me an email and saying, we have this idea for a book because we've seen a gap in the market. We have, we came across you and every single thing that we've found about you is, you know, you're always giving the same message. So little did I know that every blog post I wrote, every article I've been in, all my social media, by showing up consistently and talking about the one thing all of the time, you think that no one's listening. You know, there's so many times that I thought I was just talking to the, I mean, for years, I've actually got it in the back of the book. For years, I felt I was just talking into the wind, but I never, ever gave up because I knew, I knew I had something. And then, so when Penguin said, we've found the gap in the market and we think you're the person for it, I just rang them up straight away and I went, yep, I'm your girl. That bit was the easy bit because I just went, yep, because this is what I've been talking about. Right. But it was the consistency, as you said, the consistency of thought, of message that you'd been putting out there for a long time. I mean, this isn't just a publisher. Oh, who should we give this commission to? It, it, no. You built this up. Unknowingly, you'd almost built up this reputation, this brand. You know, when I do give talks on this, because I often get to give, asked to be given talks on, you know, if not now, when and, how, you know, and my journey and how did I get here and those kind of talks. Um, and one of the big things is that I didn't realise by writing consistently in my blogs for years, then getting up and talking about what I do, people would then go and search for what I just talked about. And, and then, of course, they find me because I'm the one that writes about it. So I had actually unknowingly created my own little little niche or microcosmos yeah. little thing. Yeah. Um, I didn't, I didn't realise that until I looked back and went, um, oh, wow, like I had actually set this all up without realising it. Yeah. So, so this, this is where, this is the payoff for you going into an area where you said that 
why does no one know about this? Well, I better fill mm. that that lack yes. of knowledge, and you filled it. Yeah, it came back, and the payoff was you getting the book commission. Wow. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. What a beautiful, a beautiful circle. Yeah, I know it was a lovely surprise, and I and I don't often say this, but I thought, yep, yeah, I I. I really, uh, I paid my dues for this book. I've really mm. paid my dues. So that's why when they said yes, I, I remember when she, I got the email like at quarter to five one Tuesday afternoon and I rang, I rang up and, and um, I said, Amy, it's Karen. And she said, gosh, you're quick. And I said, I was, I was worried the email was going to soft combust. <laughs> <laughs> a time limited offer. <laughs> it was a time, and she just laughed. And I said, I said, yep. Yeah. I said, and I just went, when can I come in? And I was in that Friday afternoon talking about, you know, in there talking about it because I thought I am not. I, it's, it's, you know, one of these things where I do quite often do things. I say yes to something, and then I, I might go and think, oh my god, afterwards, like, what do I do? But, but I, but if I know it's the right thing, I just say yes, and I can go and, you know, have a little wobble afterwards. But, but as long as I've said yes, because then I know I'm committed and I know then it's mine and I've got it. Um, how I get there and what I do if I need to go and have a theatre session or I need to go and have some sort of pep talk or I need to call a friend and go, oh, my God, like, you know, what do I do? Um, that's what comes later. But I always mm. make sure if it's the right thing, I just say, I say yes. Yeah. And, and you, you said this lovely little phrase, well, if not now, when? I suppose that yes. helps with that. I, I'm going to say yes and then I'll work out. Yes, do. yes, because I because time's going to pass anyway. So why not? I mean, obviously, say yes to the right thing. Yeah. But if it's but if it's just because I'm lacking self self uh, confidence or self doubt or whatever, because it's not my knowledge. You know, I know my I know I know my stuff. So it's it's it, it will it will be a personal thing. Um, and I just think you know what? Because I know I can blitz through that. I know I can work through that. If it's the right thing, it's the right direction. The people that want me to do this have the right intention because I will only work with people that I think want to use colour for positive good and positive change. Mm. Um, and I think they've got good ethics. If all of those things stack up and that's all right, then the, the, the only other doubt can be my own belief and, you know, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get over that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, for, so uh, on the book, what, what could people expect from it if you re if you read the book are you going to learn about what's my favorite color how do i use my color or is this well that's a lot but i think there's a deeper level as well yes there is so um all right so here i'm it's going to sound funny so here i am writing a book about color and all the way through the book i'm going it can't just be about color this this mm. cannot be just a book about color it's got to be something more and i'm thinking well that's weird because they've asked me to do a book so it's called yeah the little book of color how to use the psychology of color to transform your life that's the that's the strap line very long strap line and i'm thinking it's got to be more than color got to be more than color and it was three quarters of the way th through the book and i went ah it's a book about coming home to self it's a book yeah. about coming home it's a book about reconnecting to who we are yeah. and then that is what ended up going into the um into the uh first paragraph of the book so if you only read the first paragraph of the book, that's the book. And then I thought, yep, yeah, that, that is what this is. Because it's not a book for designers, even though it's been really well picked up by the design industry. Yeah. This is a book about the, for, for the everyday person to reconnect again with their love of colour. Mm. Because back when I wrote, when I first started writing it in 2017, I think the end of 2017, it, it was very evident that people were very scared of colour, people were scared of getting it wrong, they were looking outside of themselves, looking at trends, looking at what all the magazines said, they were looking at what their neighbours had, um, you know, looking always outside to think, what, what should I do for me that will make me feel accepted wanted loved because that's really when we talk about before about you know the need to belong the need to be accepted really is the need to be loved and i thought there's something amiss here when we're, we're looking outside of ourselves for all of this and not inside so that's why this whole book is about and it ends up actually it's, it's a personal development book in the end mm. because the the feedback that i'm getting is that when people are reading this and they're just going my gosh i have learned so much about myself and i'm connecting more with myself and now i'm showing up authentically 
and I'm using colours to wear that reflect me. I'm putting colours in my own home that reflect me and I'm, I'm, I'm happier. Like, job done, right? Mm. So um, that is really was my wish for the book. Um, and the great thing about going with, a, you know, with an international publisher is that the book is, is being translated into 12, different, 12 additional languages. Mm. So my whole dream of wanting colour to go around the world and something that is so intrinsically a part of our life and something that we don't even, um, we're not even always consciously aware of, if I can make this more conscious and if we can all show up authentically, we can all be our true selves, we can all make our own choices without looking outside for that, this is my big audacious dream and my goal and this book is starting to do that. It's starting mm. to get that message because when I get people from Korea emailing me, I get people from Russia, you know, I get people from Greece, you know, it's just, um, oh, it makes me cry. It's such mm. a beautiful thing. You know what I mean? It's just, and um, that just makes me, that makes me just so happy that people are just going, oh, wow, I, I, I never thought about colour in this way and, and now, you know, I'll never see colour in the same way again and I'm, and I'm embracing it more and loving it more. Well. Mm. To me, every single one of those people that say that is um, that makes my mojo go to like a thousand. <laughs> and thinking about because I know you do lots of work with with companies and brands and individuals as well. If there was something that you would you you would you would suggest or gift to the listeners today about how they might think about color, I know we've this is in a few minutes on a podcast, and I do recommend people get hold of the book. But what, what would you say? What, where could people start, Karen? Lots of people, I think, are working from home. Um, and it might be yeah. that we keep working from home for quite a while. Looks or like people, it, yeah. Yeah, or people choose that they want to keep working from home. <laughs> um, so it's, it's about, I always say, it's about having the colours around you that, in, that, that give you that feeling of, how, of, of how, how you want to feel personally. So what... What gets you going? What, what, what is it that you need? Because for some people, just say, for instance, you have a nine o'clock call in the morning and it's going to be a, you, you, you're really tired. You might just want to have a little bit of red around you, a red mug or something a bit red because that, because red is the colour of energy as in physical energy. So it's physically stimulating. Mm. And you might, so instead of grabbing that, you know, double espresso, you might have just a normal coffee or you might even have a tea, but having it in a red mug might just be that little bit of energy you need. You might need to be doing some accounts or some really focused work and dark blue helps focus the mind. So you might want to have some dark blue around you. You might have a collaborative meeting with staff members or team members and um, you might be having that over Zoom or you might be doing it face to face. And a really good colour to encourage and support um, collaborative communication is turquoise. Mm. So you might want to have some turquoise around. And instead of just grabbing maybe the biscuits or grabbing that tea or coffee in late afternoon, if you need a little bit of a pick-me-up because you need a bit of joy because you might be flagging a bit, orange is a great colour for bringing in joy and bringing in a little bit of, a little bit of fun. But it's also a great social um, communicator so it might be something that you need to bring just a little bit of joy and lightness into your afternoon you know every mm. there's a color for every emotion and so there's a every emotion that you feel that you want to feel there's a color for it mm. and color can change how you think how you feel how you behave in an instant so you can use color to support how you're feeling or how you want to feel and you can also use colour for how you want other people to interact with you. So colour can do all of this. It's not about having loads of colour. It's about using the right, the colour and the colour tones that you really resonate with and also the proportion and the placement. Because if you have too much of one colour, you could actually go into overwhelm and you could feel the, the negative of that colour. Right. So with the red cup, 
Yeah. That might be enough. But if you end up painting your walls red, <laughs> you'll walk in and you could absolutely go into overwhelm and you'll, you feel like something, someone is screaming at you because that's the energy of the colour. Yeah. My biggest advice is always not to overdo it, to bring colours in and see what feels right to you. And then if something doesn't feel right, it just means that maybe at that moment or that day, you just don't need the energy or the emotional energy that that colour is giving you. Or it could be that it's too saturated and you just need a lower, mm. um, because it's like a radio. Soft colours are like the radio soft and loud colours. Bright, intense colours is like the radio on full ball. Yes. And some days you do want to have the radio up and other days you just want yeah. it quietly in the background. So. Yeah. Um, using colours intentionally and using them to serve you to, 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 to get the results that you want, then that, that is what is using colour consciously. Brilliant. Brilliant. It, it, and it sounds like oh. that's it. It's, it's playing around with this and seeing, yep. you say, turn it up, turn it down, different situations, yep. see what works for you. Uh, and it's personal. It's because per yeah. people, you know, when I go and do talks, I get the hand up after I've just explained all of this and I get the hand up and go, I'm a property developer. Uh, I've got five properties. What colour should I paint them all? And I just thought, oh, they haven't listened to anything of my talk. Yeah. Um, it's not, it's not, there is not one size fits all. There is not, there's not a magic bullet, which is why there's very few people that do what I do because everything is bespoke and everything is unique and everything is to do with the, the context, with the audience, with, um, you know who is the target market with with all of these with the situation there's so many variables that you need to take into consideration which yeah. is again then the analysis work yeah and, that, um, and that's what you do with clients when you go in and, and help them with that yeah yeah i do i do a big analysis I, I ask them so i always say they go right what color we're going to have and i go well it's like fight club the first rule of fight club is you don't talk about fight club the first rule about color is we don't talk about color because if we do that, we just go down this big emotional rabbit warren and all you end up getting is, I like that one. Oh, I don't like that one. That one reminds me of my school uniform. Uh, oh, you know. Yes. You've, I've you've, been around boardroom tables where we've yes. like discussed uh, not even as big as a new brand colour for the whole company, yep. but just something pretty small. And, of course, everyone's got uh, a yep. very valid opinion. Yes, of course, because they make it all about themselves and that yes. is valid, but it's yes. not what's right for the company. Yeah. So I do the analysis part first and what comes out of the analysis is the colour. I never, ever start with colour, oh, ever. Lord, Corin, I, I wish I'd found you a few years ago <laughs> doing this sort of work. <laughs> well, I learned that the hard way. I learned that yeah. because I'm like, oh, there's got to be a different way. And I went, I know what I'll do. I'll flip it. Yeah. So um, that's the way that I always work. I always work from a conversation and from questions and get really down into the detail. Yes. And then when I've got all of that, then with my knowledge, I'm able to go, everything you've just said, this is the colours that, that represents what you've just said. And take that uh, bit of uh, subjectivity out of the equation so you can... Yeah, yeah. And then they normally go, I still don't like that colour. And I go, great, let's have a conversation about what that means to you. Yeah. And then when they realise what it means to them, I say, see how that's about you and it's not about the business. And that's how I can put the logic and the rationale in because I can then separate it. Brilliant. Brilliant. But, that took, but that took me a few years to cotton on to what was going on. Um, yeah. Because like any of us, we look for patterns of behaviour. We look at the way people respond, react to things. And that's how you start building up your theories and your ideas and your hypothesis and then you start going and trying to break it yeah. and that's how I come up with all of the things that I do because I because I'm always looking for patterns of behavior well Karen uh, wow uh, and it's been a wonderful conversation and again I guess what I love was yes we talk about color but we haven't talked about we've not gone through lots of different colors and, and what they necessarily mean but we've talked about as you said this is a journey it's about personal development. It's about understanding self, which is exactly what the podcast is all about, the Mojo podcast. Yeah, yeah. and that's what colour is. And that's what and, colour is. Yeah. And there you go. Um, so that, it's been a, a fabulous, uh, enthralling, fascinating conversation. I thank you for your 
your honesty and your energy that you brought in on a low energy day. <laughs> really appreciate well, it. When I have someone, you know, you're, you're a great, great person to speak to. And when I talk about colour, it does pick me up. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be knackered now. I'll have to sit down with a cup of tea. <laughs> We've drawn, drawn all the energy. I think that's all my stuff. energy. It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Karen, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Well, as you can tell, Karen and I had great fun recording that episode. I want to thank her for being so very open and honest to the ups and downs she's experienced along this path that she's created for herself in life. And what really came out for me, and we talked to this, is her really understanding her why, her purpose in life. Being true to herself, but also helping others fulfill their potential. And she does that via colour. This understanding, I dare say, makes things quite black and white when it comes to decision making. And another big theme that came through that she talked to, this sense of if not now, when. It's so easy to push things into tomorrow, especially when they involve change. But sometimes saying yes to big opportunities, albeit scary ones, can really propel us forward. And the other area that's really coming through for me is this message of relentless consistency born out of belief. She kept writing, speaking, despite the fear, and this grew her personal brand to the point where she was approached to write a book. The message here is to keep going with your thing. It might be a side hustle right now, but just imagine where it could take you if you keep going. I'll post links to Karen's website and to her book. There's a really good newsletter she puts out, uh, I think monthly, that I really recommend you getting on. Also, her Instagram is really vibrant and super interesting, so I'll post a link to that too. Next week on the Mojo Podcast, I'm talking to Bodie Aldridge. Coincidentally, it's another Australian voice, as Bodie is based in Byron Bay in New South Wales, but he works globally with businesses and couples focusing on relationships and what is intrinsic to good long-term relationships, and that is going to be the theme of our conversation. And remember, if you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to hear more, please do hit that subscribe button, leave a five-star rating, and if you could, write a short review on Apple Podcasts all of which helps the Mojo podcast be more discoverable to more people. Until next week, I hope your mojo continues to flow.